Good morning, everybody. It is the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, and uh, my friend David Zills, the apologist, is back. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. I got my window open a little bit just to just to savor some of the cold air that's not as cold as it could be. Yeah, that that first Midwest kind of glimpse of it's not spring yet, but it's it's maybe like less severe winter. Glorious. Yep, yep. It's just it's, glorious. It's nice sun shining. I like it. So uh, we've been kind of uh, all together moving towards this thing uh, for for a good little while. Uh, Jesus rose from the dead, right? Uh, yeah, I, th- I, th- I think so. Yeah, it, but, I, there, there's some there's some there's some stuff to talk about with that, huh? Yeah. So let's talk about that. So we, <laughs> last time we inter- last time we introduced the the argument, um, and no, oh, well. Two times ago, we introduced the argument and talked about how some some people like Gary Habermas, Mike Lacona use this minimal facts argument. And there are more facts that you could put in than just the minimal facts. There are more facts that I think are well evidenced and you can also use to make the case for Jesus' resurrection being a historical reality. And this isn't just his spirit rose from the dead, but that is he it was a bodily resurrection. Um, but the minimal facts, the what makes that argument powerful is that it's the kind of the minimum set of facts that scholars, not just Christians, but anybody who's well-versed in the material, um, the majority of them believe these are actually real facts. And so that kind of gives credence to, it, it gives this um, rhetorical argument that, okay, we're not just saying this because we're biased, but look, even even people who disagree with us agree with these things. Um, and so we talked about those minimal facts being that first Jesus died by crucifixion, and we spent some time going over the argument for why that that's historically solid. Um, and then we the, the next two facts I want to talk about today, which are uh, the, the final two facts in Mike Lacona's most recent list. It's that his, Jesus' followers and the second fact and the third fact, one of his enemies became convinced that they had interacted with the bodily risen Jesus after Jesus had been crucified. So the fact that scholars agree on isn't that these appearances were genuine and objectively real. That is where the debate is. Were they subjective, kind of in the people's minds, or were they something actually out in reality? And that's where the debate is, and we'll return to that later. But where there isn't debate is that these people were convinced that they had these experiences, um, regardless of how they're interpreted. And so this is something that is well attested, um, and it's it's there's a reason why the majority of scholars, Christian or otherwise, agree these on these things. Um, And the reason for that is that the testimony is early. It goes back to eyewitnesses. It's embarrassing, using some ease. It's multiply attested by independent sources. And then uh, one apologist used the words excruciating testimony, meaning it came at a cost. They People were willing to suffer for it. And we'll we'll come to that last because I I think uh, that argument has been overblown by people like Josh McDowell and his son, Sean McDowell, has done some helpful correctives. And I want to make sure we don't overstate the case for the apostles' martyrdoms. But, but yeah, let's go through it. Let's let's start with kind of the the most important text, probably in all of apologetics, and that's First Corinthians fifteen. Mm-hmm. So I'm actually going to pull it up. I you know I should have it memorized probably, but I don't want to misquote it. So I'm pulling it up here. Uh, first First Corinth. Oops. First Corinthians chapter fifteen. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then your faith is in vain. That is, that is, that is in there. Um, yeah, so that when, when Paul says that he's making the case that, look, this isn't just something that is nice to believe and it doesn't matter if it's real. Right. Paul is saying, if this is not real, then literally Christianity is worse than pointless. It's not just pointless, it's worse than pointless because yeah. you're giving up a lot. It, the people at that time were giving up a lot to believe it. And so like, if it's a lie and it has nothing to do with with life after death, and it's just a fairy tale. Then we like, are really, above you most, should, we are you, above all to be pitied. 
yeah, yeah, we should really give this up. But before that, there's a text that's really important that a lot of apologists and New Testament scholars have really zeroed in on, and that starts at verse 3, where Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, colon, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared. And then Paul lists the appearances to Cephas, another name for Peter, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, meaning died. Mm -hmm. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born. He appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And so uh, this passage is important because it is very early and it goes back to eyewitnesses. So that hits two of the criteria. It's early. This was written, um, I, I believe, in the mid 50s AD, which is, you know, roughly two decades after Jesus' crucifixion. So this is like from now going back to 9-11. So if someone is saying something now about 9-11 based on the fact that they have eyewitness testimony about those things, we're probably, you know, unless they're making it up, which we'll circle back to, but unless they're making it up like that, there's not really a reason to say, well, this is so late, it's probably a legend. Like no one would say that an eyewitness talking about 9-11 is saying a legend that was hearsay that developed, you know, over the centuries or decades, you know, that we have confidence that this goes back to real facts. And right. so this, this is almost a dare to go and talk with them, like go and go and see these people. You you can find them also. Uh, I feel really old now. Thank you for, for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, me too. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> at least it wasn't the 1900s, you know, as they say, mm. Back in the 1900s, uh, yeah. yeah, all yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. uh, but there's actually reason to believe that this goes earlier than two decades after the fact. And a lot of scholars think it goes back to within like five to eight years after Jesus' crucifixion. And the reason for that, uh, well, first of all, the, the consensus is, or th there's broad agreement that this is not something Paul is writing firsthand. And the reason for, that there's the, the, the view is that this is tradition that Paul got from someone else that was formulated as kind of a creed, kind of something like a prototype of, say, the Apostles' Creed for Christians to kind of memorize and say, what, what is it we're all about? And that Paul received this, and now he's just quoting it. And so there are some reasons why people think that this is a creed that Paul did not, was not the first one to formulate. And one of the reasons is that when Paul prefaces this, he says, I delivered to you what I also received. The words delivered and received are technical words for the passing on of oral tradition. And then also there are clues in the text, the fact that it's there's a lot of parallelism, which would help with uh, memorization, the fact that some of the words point back to Aramaic rather than something Paul would be likely to say. So there are a number of clues that people think this is something Paul received and didn't formulate himself. So then the question is, when did he receive it? And if you look, another companion text that's very, very important is Galatians 1 and 2, where Paul talks about his conversion, the way he received his gospel from Jesus directly and not from another human, but then he fact-checked it with the other apostles. And when you look at the timeline of where he was fact-checking his message with the other apostles, there's a meeting where he went to Jerusalem and checked with some specific named apostles. And that was likely five to eight years after the crucifixion. And so that seems to be a likely time when Paul received this. Now, if he received it, then that means it was already formulated. So if the mm -hmm. creed was formulated by then, that means the beliefs were around even earlier. And so in terms of ancient history, this is like a newsflash. This is hot off the press, going back to the events themselves, the, the, the belief in this thing. So we've checked off two boxes of criteria that historians look for to say, is this testimony credible? It's early and it goes back to eyewitnesses. Not only was Paul an eyewitness, but he lists other eyewitnesses. And um, and yeah, these are people that agreed with his message. And when you look at the earliest church fathers a generation later, they say, yep, the apostles preached this to us 
they were united in their message and the resurrection was part of their message. So, so this is early and it goes back to eyewitnesses. It's also another category, multiply attested. So the, the gospels talk about these things. And so some of the appearances, let me refer to my notes here. Hmm. So the appearance to Peter, Paul says he appeared to Cephas, um, which was Peter's name. Um, that is mentioned in Luke 24, verse 34. The appearance to the 12 is narrated by Luke and John. And then, you know, what about the 500? That's pretty interesting if 500 people at the same time uh, appeared or Jesus appeared to them. And so there, this, there are possibilities where this could be things that are narrated in the Gospels and Acts at the end of Matthew or at the end of Luke and beginning of Acts, where there are a lot of people on a mountain with Jesus. That could have been the appearance to 500. But at the end of the day, scholars are convinced these, these this is early and this is eyewitnesses and it's mul multiply attested. It's also embarrassing. So the fact that in the Gospels that the women are the first witnesses to the risen Jesus and the first witnesses to the empty tomb um, is embarrassing. There are some quotes from Jewish literature that show why this would be the case. So this is uh, from William Lane Craig, his book, Reasonable Faith. He, he quotes a uh, Jewish writing, sooner let the words of the law be burnt than delivered to women. Or here's another one, blessed are you, Lord of God, ruler of the universe, who has not created me a woman. And finally, from Josephus, let not the testimony of woman be admitted on account of the levity and boldness of their sex. So, you know, this would not fly today, but at the time, this was kind of this the view that, fly today. yeah, this would not fly today. But back then, making women your primary witnesses wouldn't have been the most compelling thing to do. On the other hand, look at how the men respond to the women. They're, they're, frightened they're they're cowering which honestly is is understandable yeah and they don't believe the women at first they you know it sounds like idle talk to them and so it makes the women look better than the men who would lead the church so this is embarrassing testimony so it's not something they'd be likely to make up when writing these accounts in the gospel right this is going out into a world and and although paul even in in corinthians talks about you know that the equality between men and women there there is neither male nor female but we are one in christ jesus that that we we don't uh, hold one sex to be greater or less than another the rest of the world did at that time um yeah. to the point that that um sadly women's testimony was inadmissible and so if you're going to put this one forward like if you're going to lie you're going to actually put forward something that that might actually be heard by somebody else that that we're we're doubling down on this is because it's it's what happened yeah. Yeah. The only reason for them to say this would be because it's what actually happened. It's not mm -hmm. something you would want to make up because it hurts your case if you're making it up. Um, and then finally, the, the we've talked about early eyewitness, multiply attested by independent sources and embarrassing. The fifth category is embarrassing or sorry, excruciating. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is the idea that the people who were claiming to have had these eyewitness experience weren't just claiming these things, but they actually believed them. They were sincere. And the main evidence for this that people will point to, um, in addition to the fact that there are some embarrassing details in their testimony, but the, the big one is the fact that they were willing to suffer and die for what they were saying. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, people can be willing to suffer and die for for a lie, um, you can look to people who who embrace martyrdom today, say the terrorists going back to 9-11 who flew the planes into the Twin Towers, they were willing to die for their message. Um, and so it doesn't show that Islam in this case is true, but it does show that they were convinced of it. What makes the apostles different from the suicide bombers is that they were not getting their story secondhand, you know, from the Quran or from somebody else. They were saying, this is something I saw myself. And so if it were not true, they would be in a position to know that it wasn't true. And so then the question comes up, who would die for a lie when you know it's a lie? Um, that there doesn't seem to be a motive for this. But this this argument has been overstated in the past. There, there have been um, people who have said, you know, all the apostles suffered martyrdom except for John. And um, this argument 
I thought was very compelling. So I wanted to dig in and I actually wrestled with this for several years because I wanted to dig in and say, okay, is, are these martyrdom accounts histori historically reliable? And do they actually, did the apostles actually get a chance to recant? Do they even have a chance to save themselves? Because it seems like that would be important if their martyrdoms count uh, for their sincerity. If If they didn't have a chance to recant, then you know, they, they, they couldn't have changed things. The idea is they have to be willing to do it knowing what the consequences are. They have to be willing to say, this is what happened, even when people are willing to put them to death for it. And as I looked into it, I found out that the case for most of the martyrdom accounts of the apostles is very weak historically. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, no, maybe they made this up. You know, if you're going to believe in the resurrection yeah. because of 13 guys, that's, you know, the 12 plus Paul, mm -hmm. you know, the 11 plus Matthias and Paul, you, that, that, you know, you want you wanted these to be reliable, reliable testimony. It's not that many people in this case. And so I, this really bothered me. And the answer I found came from this book, um, The Fate of the Apostles by Sean okay. McDowell. And he gives a very he, – he talks about all the martyrdom accounts, and he says, you know, most of these could be legendary. Some of them are probably not. In the case of Peter, Paul, um, James, the brother of Jesus, James, the brother of John, and then to a lesser extent, Thomas, who was very probably a missionary in India and martyred there. But Sean makes the important point that it's not whether – they were actually martyred that matters to the argument. It's whether they were willing to be martyred. And the evidence for that willingness is actually very strong, regardless of the evidence for whether they were actually martyred at some point. And so that's, I think, where we have to focus the argument. And there the case is very strong. I mean, you look at the fact that where are the apostles when they start preaching this message that Jesus has raised? Mm -hmm. They're right in Jerusalem, uh, preaching to the crowds who they actually say, whom you crucified. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Jesus, to be crucified, you have to tick off some people. And the people who were ticked off and crucified Jesus were there in Jerusalem. And so the apostles at first, and according to the Gospels, are cowering. They're like, we're next. And then all of a sudden, they're out there preaching, including to the people that crucified Jesus. No, nope, Jesus rose from the dead, which kind of is like saying, you done messed up, mm -hmm. which is a bold thing to say when people have the power to kill you. Um so, and, and obviously the motive to kill you. And in fact, um, Jesus warned, at least he's recorded as warning the disciples in the gospels, hey, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. If they kill me, they're going to kill you. Mm -hmm. And so either Jesus really said these things, which would have kind of emphasized this reality of the threat to the apostles, or maybe he didn't say these things, in which case, why are they there? The words were probably put there into Jesus' mouth by Jesus' followers in order to validate their later suffering. So either way, we've got this, it's either way, whether Jesus said these things or not, for the sake of argument, it supports the fact that Jesus' followers and these eyewitnesses were facing persecution of some kind. You look in Acts, and a number of times in Acts, which is their the historical case for the reliability of Acts is actually really strong. That's a topic for another time. Um, Craig Keener has a good chapter on this in the book, Jesus Skepticism and the Probability of History, which was edited by my friend Ed Kamashevsky. Um, but in Acts, you have a number of times where the apostles are flogged and told, don't do that again. And what do they do? They rejoice for their suffering and they keep doing it. Or mm -hmm. Paul starts a persecute or Saul starts a persecution in Jerusalem. Everybody scattered except the apostles. So the apostles are the only ones who aren't running, interestingly enough. Um, you look at when James, the brother of John, is beheaded, the first apostle to be killed, and then Peter's put in prison. So you, you see that this persecution wasn't just a threat because Jesus was crucified and Jesus was recorded as saying, you're next. It actually happened to them. We look at the apostolic fathers, the first generation of Christians after the apostles, and they record in a number of places. Yeah, Ignatius says, so the apostles touched Jesus' living body after he was resurrected. And for this reason, they despised death and proved to be greater than death, kind of hinting that they were bold, bold in the face of death. Polycarp, who was probably a disciple of the Apostle John, says 
uh, is encouraging people in the congregation he's writing to to endure in the face of suffering like a number of people they knew and Paul and the rest of the apostles. Be assured that these did not run in vain, but are now in the place, do them with the Lord with whom they also suffered. And then Clement probably refers, is the first outside the Bible to refer to the martyrdom of Peter and Paul. Uh, when you look at his text, Clement of Rome in the early or in the mid 90s, when you look at his text in the context of like the end of the Gospel of John and later church testimony. And so all throughout the Gospels, Acts, uh, later church writings, you see the gospel, you see the apostles facing death and still preaching the message. And so that's the point. They were willing to die for their message. And so then the question again comes up, who would be willing to die for a lie, knowing it's a lie? Right. It's it it it's a little bit debatable for some of the minor apostles, uh, whether or not they were they were martyred. But at the same time, like even if one or two very clearly were, like if you're in a class of 12 and you all get hired by the same company and then the first guy dies, you're going to probably reevaluate the job. And then the second guy dies, you're, you're probably going to reevaluate the job. Maybe maybe all but John didn't. I, I think they did. But at, at the same time, that a few of them still suffered a very, very painful martyrdom and the rest were still preaching. It shows they were willing to suffer the same. Yeah, and I think uh, um, Chuck Colson's quote um, really kind of makes it hit home for me because Chuck Colson was involved in the Watergate scandal. He was one of the guys that got sent to prison for Watergate, you know, back during Richard Nixon's presidency. And he became a Christian and started prison a prison ministry in addition to a number of other ministries that are still going on today. But he said, if 12 of the most powerful men in the world, in the case of Watergate, could barely keep a secret for very long, there's no way that 12 of the least powerful men in the whole world could keep a secret their whole lives in the face of what they were facing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we have testimony for these resurrection appearances that's early. It goes back to eyewitnesses, Paul, and he fact-checked it with the other apostles in Jerusalem. It's embarrassing. There are aspects of it you wouldn't want to make up because it would hurt your case. It's multiply attested by independent sources, and it's excruciating. People gave this testimony at great cost. And so this is the reason that most scholars today, Christian or non-Christian, when they are studying this matter in detail, they say, yeah, these appearances, the people who said they had these experiences really believed that they had had them. We can talk about whether they were objective or whether they were something like a hallucination or mass hysteria later. That's where the debate is. But the fact that the experiences happened is not really a matter of debate today, at least not, not significantly. I think that's, yeah, that, that's pretty compelling stuff. David, thanks so much for joining us today. Yep. It's been fun. Hey, have a good one. You too.